Making an entire video game is an extremely daunting task, whether you're working alone or even working with a team. There's a lot that goes into it, and it's super easy to just ignore some of the super important initial steps that could either make or break your game further down the line. Now, as you may know, I recently stopped working on a game that I've been developing for almost a year, and a lot of the issues that started to come up later in development were because of my severe lack of preparation. But as I'm starting the development of my new game, I'm gonna do everything in my power to plan this game out and make it as organized as possible. So join me as I start making my game and teach you what you should be doing when starting game development. I'm gonna try to make it as interactive and fun as possible because I know a lot of this stuff is pretty easy to just brush off. You technically don't need to do any of these when starting to make a game, but I highly recommend them. Most of them are actually industry standards for development and design in general, so hopefully you could learn some new stuff by the end of this video too. Now with that being said, let's get into it. So first we're gonna get our idea. Okay, this one's pretty simple. To make a game, we need to know what to make. And that all starts with either a mechanic, story, or any other ideas. I'd imagine that if you want to make a game, you probably already have an idea for it, so I'm not really going to go over this one too much. But if you don't have an idea or want to come up with a new one, two prime brainstorming locations that I've discovered are the shower and the great outdoors. Honestly, any activity that has me standing up or active always gets the thoughts flowing. But anyways, once you have your idea for your lovely game, stop. Take a very close look at it. How big is this game? How long do you think it would take to make? Multiply that by 40. But most importantly, is this a magnum opus with a huge scope? <laughs> better not be. If this is one of your first games, make sure the entire idea can be written on a sticky note. All the features, mechanics, story, everything. If you're super adamant about making a bigger game, do the sticky note method for the demo, then after completely finishing the demo in its entirety, you can upgrade to an index card for a bigger game. But that's it. Do not pass this threshold. Trust me. This will make your game scope way smaller, and you'll be able to finish it relatively quickly. Also, another thing that a lot of people starting out get stuck on is the game engine. And my honest advice for this is the faster you choose one, the faster you could start making your game. So just choose one. Each engine can almost do everything. You can try and do some research, but in the end, engine doesn't really matter unless you're making a cinematic masterpiece. Then you could use Unreal 5. Alright, now that you have your game idea ready to go, it's time to start planning. Let's start with the game design document. Now look, this is probably the most important one, but let's be for real. Who is reading this? No one reads anymore, let alone write. I've always been a visual learner, and basically writing a whole explanatory essay in MLA format about my game sounds extremely boring. I actually tried making a game design document for my first game, but eventually got bored and left it incomplete. So if there was only some way I could make this otherwise boring document actually look cool and be fun to make. Luckily we can, with this video's sponsor, Milanote. I don't think you understand how long I've been wanting to say that. Milanote is an online canvas where you could plan, brainstorm, and collaborate on any creative projects, including game design. They even have templates for game development specifically, as well as a bunch more for any other hobbies you might have. I'm gonna be real with you guys, I've been looking at Milanote ever since my disastrous game design document for my first game, and I feel like this makes it so much easier to organize each part of my game. The best comparison I have is that it's basically a picture book that outlines any creative topic you want, as opposed to the academic paper format that regular game design documents follow. For my new game, I've been building out my board and have it split into four different sections. Concept, level design, character design, and a to-do list. As you can see, each of them have their own boards, which are basically like subfolders for each topic you want to plan. So let's go through some of mine so you can see how I've been putting my game together so far. For my game's references, I've got six games here. I put them each in their own columns with a picture and a short description of why it's a reference. Most of them are rhythm games, but I'd say the most accurate description of my game idea would be a mix of crosscode and hi-fi rush, with the dungeon generation of Pokemon Mystery dungeon. Let's look at the level design next. So in the demo, I only want three levels, a factory, a forest, and a volcano, in that order. These are all sequential, so I have these arrows to show that they come one after another. I also have a list of features to implement for each one, so I could have a bit more direction when working on them. For the extra levels, I just have a collage here of a bunch of different ideas, like a water level where you're floating on objects, a cave, and a couple more that I could potentially pick up later. I use Milanote's online web clipper tool to add these directly into my board, which is super useful because I don't need to painstakingly save or screenshot the image, rename it and move it to a proper folder because of my perfectionism, and then finally add it into my project. This saves me so much time. For the main mechanics, I put gifts for them so you could kind of see what I was going for with each of them. Movement's gonna have our typical walk and sprint. Attacking will be similar to cross code with the addition of the rhythm mechanic. Inventory is gonna be like Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, where you can find different floor pickups and either consume or throw them. And there's also gonna be a skill tree for some unique builds. I even started up a list of some ideas for upgrades in the same column. So for our main characters, I have this board, where I put together all the references and art, as well as some of my own pixel art so I could have everything laid out nicely. I'll probably add some lore below these sections in the future, but for now, no lore for me, because we all know what happened in my last game. Lastly, for the enemies, I have these robot dogs, which will have different attacks for each area, but it'll look pretty similar so I could save time on making a trillion sprites. And yes, the reskins from the dog before are relaxed. And to hold everything together, I have the main to-do list right here, so I could actually have a plan of what I'm gonna do. Having a to-do list is super important when you're making a game, and having it on Milano is really nice, especially since you can make subtasks, so you can be a little more specific with your steps if they're a bit broad like mine. 
Having all your ideas, levels, and mechanics planned out and organized in one place makes it so much easier to implement the game itself, since you don't need to worry about what to do next or get stuck constantly adding new things to do if you don't have a plan. Millinote makes it super easy to keep everything in one place, either for your game or any other creative planning. They even have a mobile app that syncs with the desktop version, so you could add any new notes or ideas that you might forget when you're out on the town. And the best part about it is that it's free, with no time limit. So if you want to start up a board yourself to make a game design document or plan any other project, just click my link in the description or the pinned comment. But yeah, thanks again to Milano for sponsoring this video, and now on to the next part of starting your game, prototyping. What we want for the initial coding stage is to see if our idea is good, and to do that we can make a prototype, which is basically a demo with placeholders and terrible art to see if the mechanic itself is fun. This avoids wasting a bunch of time making art or planning out a game that could potentially not even be an enjoyable experience. Now with my game, since I'm planning a top-down dungeon crawler, my final prototype is going to consist of multiple floors of enemies, and I'll show off the fighting mechanics I'm thinking of, but there's still one type of prototype that we could make that's much easier. Now there are two types of prototypes, low fidelity and high fidelity. In my last game, I went straight to high fidelity, make the entire functional game, get feedback later. This is a big problem, because changing stuff when you've already spent weeks or even months on it adds way more work and is extremely time consuming. A very easy way to get your idea out there and get super harsh feedback on it is to make a low fidelity prototype. This is an extremely terribly drawn version of how your game will play. It could either be a sketch on paper where you draw the concept and explain it, or a short animation to just show the essence of the game. Since it already looks bad, people are going to be less likely to go easy on you since you've basically put in very low effort to make it. This is exactly what we want. Let me show you an example. In my game, I really want to have a rhythm aspect. The main character is a dog with a mechanical implant, and staying on beat will make the implant perform better. I want to give some sort of bonus for attacking on beat, so I think adding rhythm game elements will be super fun. So for example, offbeat attacks will act like normal attacks, and they'll be like any regular top-down game. Depending on the attack pattern, if you're on beat, you get a bonus to add something to your combo or does something special. I'm still workshopping it, but now that I showed you a terribly made prototype, you shouldn't feel bad saying it looks awful. So if you have any ideas for the rhythm mechanic, feel free to let me know. But I'm not just going to show you guys. To stay true to my word and practice what I preach, I actually went out into the field to get some feedback for my prototype from the harshest people I know, my friends. And I actually have all the notes right here with all the feedback I got. And yes, I don't only draw like a five-year-old, my handwriting is a worthy competitor. In the prototyping stage, it's honestly the more the merrier, because you get a bunch of different perspectives on your idea that could either help you find pitfalls or make it even better. So yeah, as you can see, making prototypes and getting feedback is a super important part of the design process, and you should definitely consider doing it for your game. Now that you finally have a solid plan of the mechanic itself, it's time to get coding. We know exactly what we want now since we made a design document and showed people our terrible prototypes, so this should be pretty simple. So we just gotta hop in here and, uh, oh, I broke it. Hmm. If there was only some way I could save previous states of my code to more effectively track my game's changes and get- Alright, let's talk about version control. Okay, this one's also super important. Version control can be a lifesaver in a lot of scenarios when making a game. Version control lets you basically save your coding progress, and you can go back and forth between your saves to either check previous versions of your game, or basically use it as an escape rope to leave any disaster you've gotten yourself into. It's also great for tracking progress. If you feel like you haven't gotten anything done, looking at your version history can help you see all the things you've finished to get where you are. Now you may be asking, how do I set up this magical feature. Luckily, there's an app for it, don't worry. What we're going to use for tracking our saves is GitHub. Now, GitHub is basically a website where a bunch of people put their code and it gets saved in repositories. Think of a repository as the place where you keep all your saves. This is great since it shows the entire history of what you've changed. And if you have a team, everybody can set it up and work on the same project super easily. So let's set this up in the easiest way possible. First, you're going to make yourself a GitHub account. Just sign up on their website. Next, we get GitHub Desktop, which is also on their website. When you open up GitHub Desktop, it's going to look like this. Before we start, let's hop on Godot and make the game itself. If you have a game already, you could skip this part. When we have the game set up, we're going to go back to GitHub Desktop and go to the top left in Options. Here, we're going to sign into GitHub. It'll have an external link where you sign in on a browser, so just sign in through there. When you're signed in, we're going to click on Add an Existing Repository from your local drive. Here, you're going to find your game folder and select it as the repository. If you're having trouble finding the folder, Godot has them listed under their names when you open the app. So after you select the folder, you'll click Add a Repository, and it's going to tell you that it's not a Git repository, because it isn't. So click the Create a Repository link, and it'll bring you here. So these are all the options for your repository. Make sure the repository's name is the same as your game, to avoid having to move a bunch of files. Add a nice little description. For the thing that says git ignore, there's an option for Godot, which is amazing. They also have options for other engines like Unity and Unreal. A git ignore file basically blocks unnecessary files from being saved on the repository. For a license, you don't really need one for most cases, but you could always add one later. So we make the repository and we see this. So now we're gonna click the option to publish the repository. Now you could go on GitHub and see the repository itself. This is basically where you're gonna see all the changes you make over time. So let's actually make a change so you can see what I mean. So I'm in Godot right now and I'm just gonna add an image. Let's just put them in the center 
center of the screen. So when I save the level, I could go back to GitHub Desktop, and now there are changes. On the bottom left, you can commit these changes, which basically means to create a save. So for this save, I'm gonna call it added dog, and I'll write a short little description about what I did. When I'm done, I could click commit to main, and it makes a save on our computer, but it's still not on GitHub yet. To get it on GitHub, all we need to do is push the changes. Luckily, GitHub Desktop just kind of tells you what to do, so you could follow what it says on screen. But after a couple of commits, it mostly becomes muscle memory. So yeah, now we have our commits on GitHub, and we can see a history of all the changes we've made. After a while, it'll get a little more full. I could actually show you an example, because Godot is on GitHub. So Godot has 77,000 commits, which is insane. This is an open source project, which means anyone can see the code and help update it. But still, that's wild. Anyways, though, that's how you set up version control. Whenever you make a change, try to get into the habit of committing so you can have a good track record of your game's updates. Version control is super important, and I really hope you consider using it. I used it a little bit for my previous game and fell into the trap of committing only huge updates. And coming from experience, I suggest you try not to do that. Commit every small thing you can, especially when working with other people. Commits are supposed to be small, because making a save state of an enormous update can break a bunch of other things. And you also don't want to be writing a Shakespearean work for the commit message. But yeah, now that we have version control set up, we could actually start coding. So I'm not going to go too deep into teaching coding right now. And in the future, I'll probably leave the more in-depth stuff for the second channel. But I do want to talk about some general guidelines that could help you with your first game. First off, this initial build better be placeholder city. For my game specifically, top-down games are a bit art heavy, with some sprite sheets going into the hundreds. So before I release my demo, I'm going to use a bunch of placeholders. The only time I'm going to make the art is if I can't find a placeholder for a mechanic or feature I'm doing. And even then, I'll make the art purposefully bad so I don't dwell on how bad it looks for hours. Then, when it finally comes time for releasing the demo, we have two options. Either release it with placeholders if they were free to use, or be like me and use copyrighted assets that'll probably give me a lifetime sentence on Delfino Plaza. To fix this, what I'm going to do is crudely make all the art myself and publish that disaster instead. But that's fine. Think about it like this. If people like it with bad art, then they'll love it with good art, right? My biggest time sink in the last game was art, and I think having placeholders would just speed up the process so much. And yes, my perfectionism kills me inside when I don't make everything exactly how I want, but I think this is a major pitfall that people could fall into, including myself, that I want to avoid at all costs. Also, code organization is key. I went over my last game on the second channel, and I couldn't even find where the main mechanic started and ended. I kept using the excuse of no one's ever going to look at my code, but I never realized that future me would exist. So try your best to organize. There are some tutorials out there on state machines, containerization, and much more. And to be honest, those buzzwords sound scary, but all they really are are just ways to organize your code. And when you learn the fundamentals, you never really forget. Now this one I haven't tried, but I've heard really great things about it. It's been suggested to me a lot, so let's talk about finding a community. Now I'm gonna be completely honest, even though I'm a lone wolf when doing most of my creative process, sometimes I have no idea what's going on and have to ask people. I've recently learned that tutorials and looking stuff up gets absolutely slammed by just talking to a person that actually knows what they're doing. And a community is a perfect place to get to know people like that. In a community, you have the chance to talk to people going through the same thing as you, get some feedback, give some feedback, and even make some new friends. Now most communities are on Discord, but how do you find one? Hmm, if there was only an official Discord for Brainless, so I could just go straight there and- The official Brainless Discord server is now open, so you could come in and meet some new people, have some great conversations, and get to see me on DaVinci Resolve for 90% of the day. I've been getting a lot of questions about a Discord server for a while now, and even though I still have a super busy schedule, I wanted to open it so that anyone wanting to get into game development or just hang out with other people could join and be part of the community. I have a bunch of channels available for game development stuff, non-game development stuff, and a couple other things to explore. I spent a while working on the server to make it an enjoyable experience for for anyone joining, so hopefully you guys will like it. Another thing I want to do to kick off the Discord server is what I call the official Brainless Crisp 20 challenge. So recently I released a demo for the now deprecated Brainless game, where all you have to do is collect a couple of keycard pieces and escape a factory. While I was polishing the demo, I thought it would be a fun idea to add a speedrun timer to see how fast you could beat the level. So I was thinking, as a nice little event to start off the Discord server, I'll be holding a speedrun challenge, and whoever can get the fastest time by December 20th will be receiving a crisp $20 in whatever gift card they want. I have all the submission requirements on the server, but but all you need to basically do is submit a screenshot of the end screen and a video of you doing it so I can see if it's real. Also, to add some more participation, I'll be giving an extra crisp 20 to a random person that submits a run beating my best time. So yeah, if you're interested in joining the server, the link will be down in the description, and I hope to see you try and beat my 38 second run. But anyways, those were all the things that I suggest to do when starting your game. I hope you learned something in this video, and if not, I hope it was at least a little entertaining. If you have any other tips for people that are starting to make a game, feel free to leave them in the comments. I've seen some really insightful stuff in previous videos. But yeah, now that you have a baseline of what to do when making your game, it's time to actually start making it. And I guess that goes for me too. I just gotta wait till my sentence is up. Or they finally realize they wrongfully convicted me and some blue guy is out there vandalizing the whole island. I don't even look like that.
Hello everybody, thank you for making it to the end of the video once again. I really hope you guys enjoyed this one and hopefully integrate one of these things into your game if you haven't already. I guess you could basically call this my first devlog since I did the whole planning stage in this video, but I haven't really coded anything yet. I've been refining the music mechanic a bit, but would still love to hear any suggestions or ideas in the comments. As for the Discord, I did set it up so that members get an exclusive role, so if any existing or upcoming members join the Discord and link your YouTube, you'll have a nice little role for being part of the little guy support team. I also saw that when I made a post last week to the discord a lot of people seem to want a game jam i honestly didn't think the demand was that high so i'll definitely add it to the checklist in the future but anyways thanks again for watching hopefully i could post again before the end of the year and i'll probably see you guys on the second channel next that being said um goodbye